The appointed hour of 6.30 having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking the link on the town's webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, special permit granting authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call mm -hmm. vote of the regular members of the ZBA who have been impaneled for considerations of the items on tonight's agenda. I'm Steve Judge, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Ms. Waldman? Here. Mr. Barrick? Mr. Greeny? And Mr. Meadows? Here. Also in attendance tonight, Maureen Pollock, planner, Dave Waskevitz uh, with the building inspections department, and Chris Bresta, planning director for the town of Amherst. The zoning board of is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of, the, of Massachusetts for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and the general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, during, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to raise to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function in the Zoom app. The chair will, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will then hear responses from the applicant to the public comments. At this point, the board will either close or continue the public hearing to a later date. The board will conduct a public meeting on the application. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to follow the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day, day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must, permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda is as follows. ZBA FY 2021-02, Bill and Karen Tunnell, to review the updated site plan, building elevation, and floor plan pursuant to conditions one, two, and seven of the approved ZBA FY 2020-10 special permit, located at 1530 Southeast Street, map 26B, parcel three. Outlying residents RO district, Low, de low density residential RLD and aquifer recharge protection ARP zoning districts. <laughs> FY 2021-05, Rise Holdings Inc. 
review the proposed mural on the exterior building wall pursuant to condition six of the special permit ZBA FY 2019 10 located at 169 Meadow Street, MAP 4B, Partial 6, Light Industrial LI Zoning District. That's our public, our agenda for the public meeting. For the public hearing, ZBA 2020-42, Faye Crosby, request a special permit to allow a non-owner occupied duplex under sections 3.3211 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 65 High Street, MAP 14B, Parcel 90, General Residence RG Zoning District, and ZBA FY 2021-01, Harms Way LLC, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Sections 8 and 15, as well as Section 10.1 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. The petitioner is requesting an appeal of the Building Commissioner's Advisory, advisory Opinion regarding section 6.6 .6 and 3.30 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. In an email correspondence dated July 1st, 2020, submitted to the Amherst Planning Director in relation to properties identified as MAP Parcel 14B 250 and 14B 251. We will then have a, 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 the general comment period for public comment on matters not before the board tonight and any other business not anticipated by the chair within the last 45 hours, 48 hours. It is my understanding that we're, that there is an agreement to continue ZBA 2021 until October 1st. So I'd like to dispose of that item <clears throat> at first in the agenda. I'm going to recuse myself from the consideration of this matter. I have made public statements about my position regarding the underlying project and I feel I have not and while I have not opined on the appeal before the board tonight, I believe I can believe I could evaluate the appeal without prejudice. I want to avoid even the appearance of bias in my deliberation on this matter. Mr. Langsdale will be the acting chair for consideration of ZBA 2021. So Mr. Langsdale, um, you can take the chair for that matter. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start just because uh, Mr. Judge has recused himself I'd just like to go through the uh, member, sitting members again uh, and just do, uh, 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 you know, that we're here. Okay, because it, it's changed. So uh, I'm the acting chair, Keith Langsdale, here. Tammy Parks. Here. Joan O'Meara. Dylan Maxfield. Here. And Craig Meadows. Craig. Here. Thank you. Um, so, um, because uh, the- Excuse me, uh, Mr. Acting Chair. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> there's one more sitting member. We oh, there is? Sharon. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't told that. There we go. I'm here. So, uh, Sharon Waldman, she's here. Good, thank you. Um, so, uh, because the, uh, Building Commissioner of the Town of Amherst, Rob Mora, couldn't be here tonight. Um, he's asked uh, that we continue this and uh, this application and we can uh, continue it to October 1st. So I make a motion that this uh, application be continued to October 1st, 2020. Is there a second? Second. At 6.30. At 6.30, sorry. Okay, Second. thank you. Uh, so, um, any discussion? All right, then we'll take a vote. Uh, I, Keith Langsdale, I can share. Aye. Uh, Tammy Parks. Aye. Uh, Dylan Maxfield. Aye. Craig Meadows. Aye. Sharon Waldman. Aye. Thank you. Then this uh, application will be continued to October 1st, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Langsdale. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2021-02. Bill and Carol Tunnell to review the updated site plan, building elevations and floor plan pursuant to conditions one, two and seven of the approved ZBA FY 2020-10 special permit located at 1530 Southeast Street, 
Map 26 3, 26B, Parcel 3, outlying residential RO, low density residential RLD, and aquifer recharge protection ARP zoning districts. Are there any disclosures for this matter? We have received from the applicant site plans, floor plans, landscape plans, lighting plans, and elevations for the special permit previously approved in 2019 and for what is being currently proposed. We have also received a management plan, a complaint response plan, and a sample lease. I think that's all we've, I think that sums up all the uh, material submitted uh, on this application. Is that right, Maureen? That is correct. Um, at this point, the applicant could present the application and the petition to the board. Um, does the applicant wish to speak regarding this application? Is there anybody here? To be honest, I don't see Bill Tennell in attendance. Neither do I. Uh, perhaps, um, maybe we can well, move on to the next item and I will send him a quick email to see if he's gonna join us, if you're agreeable to. I'm, a, I'm agreeable to that. Uh, okay. If we can get him to do that. All right, so um, I'm, I move we suspend the public meeting on this uh, matter until later in this meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, the motion, the vote occurs on the motion to suspend this till later in this meeting tonight. It's a roll call vote required. The chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Um, Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Um, that's it. Motion carries. So we'll move on to the next item in the agenda. ZBA FY. It, now this is a, this was, would be the um, public, public hearing, I think. Yep. Nope, this is still the public meeting. Public meeting on uh, Rise Holdings, Inc to review the proposed mural on the exterior building walls pursuant to condition six of the special permit ZBA FY 2019-10, located at 169 Meadow Street, map 4B, parcel six, light industrial LI zoning district. Are there any disclosures? If not, um, is the applicant there to, oh, I, we've received uh, submissions from the, uh, presented to the board. The board received a PowerPoint presentation describing the mural, subjects, the artist selection process, and a timeline. Um, does the applicant wish to speak and present his proposal to the board? We do, Mr. Chair. Um, and who's representing the, the applicant? Tom Reedy. And your address, Mr. Reedy. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if I can get right into it then. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst here on behalf of RISE uh, and its request to put murals up uh, on its recreational marijuana dispensary and co-located with their off-site medical marijuana dispensary at 169 Meadow Street in Amherst. Uh, I've got with me, and Maureen, I don't know if you've given them panelist ability as well, but Ben Sussman, who is the outreach specialist, and then Jake uh, Burgess, who is their general manager. I'll make it for Jake. Jacob. Jacob, yeah, and, and Ben as well. Perfect. Okay. Um, so maybe, Mr. Chair, I'll just, we'll just get right into it, if that's yeah, okay. Just, just yeah, describe the, uh, Perfect. The, what the applicant um, is seeking. Sure. So uh, we can give you the Reader's Digest version or we can get into a, a little bit more, more nuts and bolts. Um, ultimately, I'll turn it over to Ben to talk through the specific proposal. But high level, what uh, RISE is requesting is there's a condition six of the special permit for the use, which requires that any significant alterations to the building to come back before the ZBA at a public meeting. And so um, while we don't have a design yet, as if you've looked through the packet, you'll see 
uh, that we have not selected an artist, we have not selected a, a design. Um, these are not signs, um, they're gonna be murals. And so we'd obviously accept a condition that says they're not going to be signs. Um, and we'd also accept the condition that we have to, assuming you approve it, we have to submit the final design to the, the inspection services department with a copy to the planning department. Um, but really the request is a simple one um, to put up murals on, to have the ability to put up murals on all four of the walls at the dispensary. And maybe I'll turn it over to Ben to talk about it a little bit more. And, and Maureen, if you want to, if you have that PowerPoint, I don't think we're going to go through the whole thing, but maybe just to identify what we're looking at. Oh, sure. Uh, ben, I'll let you, uh, if you have the PowerPoint, uh, to be in charge of that. Okay, cool. Um, let me see. Let me share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, can everybody see that? Yep. All right. Let me get that up there. Okay, yeah, so for, first of all, you know, obviously thank you everyone um, for, for uh, hearing us out. Um, definitely thanks to Maureen, who's been extremely helpful to me, you know, from weeks ago when I first started, you know, asking questions about how, how to um, possibly get this done. Um, so yeah, um, you know, this is definitely a project that we're, we're passionate about um, at RISE and, and something that we really feel would, would uh, you know, be a great thing for, for the community. So um, let's get into it here. So yeah, um, you know, so uh, why are we here today? So uh, Amherst has a long tradition of public art, um, celebrating rich, natural, historic, and intellectual traditions that make it one of uh, America's greatest small towns. Uh, as proud members of the local business community, we're excited to share a proposal for public art at our location at 169 Meadow Street in Amherst. In the following pages, we outline the theme and the inspiration we hope to capture with a beautiful mural for all of our fellow residents to enjoy. So, you know, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, we don't have, you know, a mural proposal to a uh, specific piece of art to show you today, but, you know, a big part of this is going to be the theme and what we're presenting to this uh, list of, you know, really fantastic artists that they're going to be able to um, really be restrained and, and draw inspiration from. So um, the theme, um, artists will be asked to take inspiration from the lush nature, rich history, regional art, intellectual contribution, and the cultural influences of the area, the Northeast, the land and topography, the foliage, the seasons changing, uh, the native animals, rivers, ponds, the acreage and the land orientation, Farming and rural settings, the rural perspective with city lights in the background. The illuminated intellectual Americana of this area has been fostered through artists, authors, professors, poets, and craftspeople. This area was first developed during colonial America, which can be a source to inform, but should only be minimally drawn from for this installation. Um, so uh, what follows, this is the actual creative brief that we're going to be providing to the uh, list of uh, 10 artists that we currently have for them to provide us with a sketch of what their proposed uh, mural would look like. And then from that, those sketches will uh, be where we make our final selection. So um, who is RISE? You know, we believe that cannabis is for everyone and no matter your lifestyle or level of wellness, there's a way for this humble plant to improve your well-being. That is, uh, <clears throat> that is, that's why making you comfortable and helping you feel informed is the foundation of every Rise store experience. Um, so there's a link to our company profile, some information on the location, um, which you know I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, let me see here. So artist and mural inspiration. Um, we already kind of went over that part. Mm -hmm. um, these are gonna be some notable figures that we're gonna highlight for the artists just to give them, you know, idea of uh, some of the rich history of the area. You know, the, the art history here is, is amazing. Um, so definitely a, a, a lot to choose from and a lot to draw inspiration from. Um, ben, do you want to show them, do you want to show them the building and just what sides of the building? Yeah, the yeah, definitely. I can skip through some of this stuff. So that's like, you know, this is the actual creative brief for the, what's going to be provided the artists. Um, so timeline, this just gives you an idea of uh, you know, what we're looking at in terms of uh, getting the installation done. Um, so here we go, here's uh, Rise Amherst, 169 Meadow Street. Um, 
So here is the north wall and the entrance of the building. South wall, east wall. Um, so uh, this uh, is a, another photo of the south wall. Um, this would be um, facing Meadow Street. Um, so this is um, one of the areas proposed to be um, used for the mural. So this is the, uh, the entrance and the north wall. We're not gonna be touching the actual entrance to the dispensary or the, uh, the exit, I believe. Um, east wall, so this, this uh, measurement doesn't include the gable. We're gonna verify that uh, prior to the installation. We actually didn't have that and uh, I uh, attempted to get up there with a, a tape measure but failed. Um, so um, let me see. And then, you know, uh, after this is a list of the artists for you all to look at, a really um, a fantastic list of just world-class artists you know, people that have international profiles. Um, so it would really be something that would you know, really make the location iconic and just, you know, bring a, a, a piece of art to, to Amherst that I think would just, you know, be amazing for everybody. Um, so Ricky Watts, Gus Cuddy, you guys can all kind of check these out and hit some of these links um, if you're interested. Um, so the selection jury, you know, this is an important piece I just wanted to highlight. You know, one thing we wanted to do is really bring in voices from the community to participate in this. So there wasn't just, you know, Rise and GTI that were ultimately selecting this artist. Um, so from the town of Amherst uh, on the jury, we're gonna have uh, Cinda Jones, the uh, president of, of uh, Coles, uh, Hannah Rechstaffen from the Mill District, Bill Kaizen, uh, the chair of the Public Arts Commission. And then I actually just spoke to um, Gabrielle Gould today from the Amherst bid, who will also be our, uh, or a, a juror from, from Amherst. And then here's a list of uh, the jurors from GTI and RISE. Um, ben Kovler, our CEO. Michael Fields, our Director of Corporate Social Responsibility. Uh, myself, uh, Brendan Bloom, the Vice President of Retail Development. Meg Kinney, our Vice President of Retail Marketing. And uh, Jennifer Dooley, Chief Strategy Officer. Um, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for your consideration. And uh, yeah, we're excited about the uh, potential of this. So. Great. Happy to answer any questions that you guys have. So it uh, seems to me that you you have three sides of the building that you're going to you're proposing to have the mural on. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah. Three sides of the building. Um, the one thing that I I would ask is: Is there any limitations in the state cannabis laws regarding um, the images? I know there's restrictions on signs, but is there anything that regards regarding the images that may be attractive to young adults. I'm thinking of like, um, Joe Camel was a, was a controversial figure a few years ago because it was a friendly cigarette vendor, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And is there, I'm unfamiliar if the Cannabis Commission has any rules, regulations, or laws that restrict the kind of images that you can present to the public so it doesn't entice young people. Does anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, I do know the answer to that. So yes, there is, um, you know, regulations from the CCC and we've actually included that in the brief. Um, so I can actually just read that. So uh, one thing that is mentioned in here to the artists um, in the presentation that you guys have is, um, I'll just skip to that part. Um, let's see. Uh, so it says works referencing these themes will be rejected. Any references to children or childlike depictions, toys, candy, cartoons, puppies, pastels, um, so yeah, that's that's the part. There's there's more to that that represent references uh, reasons that the art would be rejected, but um, that particular part um, speaks to what you were asking. I guess I didn't see that in in the presentation that you made. Is that I the creative brief? I hustled him along, Mr. Chair. That was yeah, uh, that was good. I'm glad you did. But I mean, I'm <laughs> just looking for the I'm looking for the uh, place where that is in the presentation. Yeah. So it's in oh, the, I got it. Actual, I got it. Cool. Yeah. Yep. So sign like expressions. All right. The only thing, I, any reference, it would be good if you would, um, I would like you to, to think about um, projecting any kind of uh, image that is particularly um, attractive to, to young people, to youngsters. So I know you're getting at that here without explicitly stating it, but um, as you would go forward with this, I think that would be helpful uh, to, 
re reject any state, that you're going to reject any images that are particularly attracted to or designed to attract young, very young people or less than 21 years of age, whatever. Okay. I think we could probably, you know, something designed to attract something like that. Cause yep. obviously, you know, art subjective. Right. So right. I think if it's, it has the intent of doing it. I think that's probably a step in the wrong direction. So that, I don't but see any Designed to attract. Yeah. yeah. I think that kind of language in reframing would be something I would like to see. And are there other uh, comments from questions or comments from board members? Can I just clarify one thing? So you, when you were showing the picture with the gable, you said that the art would go to the top of the gable or it would not? It would just be on the on the concrete surface of the building or would it also be, I mean, it looked like siding to me. So I'm wondering if you're, in, is the intention to paint the siding? I th that's a great question. I actually had the exact same question myself. What I was saying during that particular slide is that we, we when we got the measurements, we didn't have the measurements for the gable included. Um, but uh, I think the uh, challenge of painting the siding is something uh, that I'll get an answer on. Um, but we're, we're certainly going to get the dimensions. And then um, after speaking to some of the artists, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the feasibility of, of painting that siding is either. So I, I mean, I think we'd like to have the opportunity to paint it because yep. I, I mean, artists are creative and may come up with a creative way to utilize the, you know, the, the clabberds in a different way. So we, I think we've asked for the opportunity to do it. Um, so either way. So, yes, I think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Mr. Maxfield. Um, you said just the entrance wouldn't be painted, but the front's still going to be painted there and all that blue section, correct? Correct. Got it. Thank you. Are you intending to award to more than one artist? Uh, it'll, be, it'll be one artist. And Ms. Pollock, did you raise your hand? Yes. So can you clarify, you said you're, you're intending to uh, paint three sides of the building. So which, which side would not be painted? The, West. Yes. Yeah. West. Okay. Where the delivery port is, that, that area. Okay. This one, Parks. Is, that, is that the exit that you were talking about? You were saying no, I, think, I think what Ben was talking about was the, so if you, I don't know if, well, we can do it. So on the east side is the exit. I don't know if you've been into the dispensary, but it, they route you around and you come out of that east side. I think you know, Ben was clear that the entrance wasn't going to be painted. It looks maybe from where the blue was that the exit may be painted from, from what it looked like in the presentation. Ben, I don't know if, I mean, again, I think we'd like to have the opportunity to, I think we will say the entrance won't be, but the balance of those three sides, we'd like the opportunity to have those painted again to give a larger canvas, I suppose. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Mr. Maxfield. So I mean, as, as is required, I guess this has been posted to all the butters and no butters are here. I'm correct about that. No one, no public comment from anyone who lives in that area. No, I don't think we needed to notify the abutters because this is a public meeting. So there's yeah. not a butter for, a, a butter notification. Um, if I think there's like eight abutters total here. Um, one of them's, uh, I think the town of Amherst, one of them's Joe Sykowski, who is, I think, who sold the land to Rise. So, I mean, these, these folks are pretty responsive if anybody were to say anything. And if you're familiar with the site, um, and where th these walls are facing. I mean, you're, you have to be like right in front or on the property to actually see them. And generally uh, public meetings don't have public comment. We do it at times we can, but we generally don't hold open for public comment at public meetings. Mr. Maxfield. I guess my only, my only concern about that, why I asked is, uh, you know, me personally, I've never been a big fan of uh, murals and, and, and stuff like that on, on public buildings. And uh, I don't live over there. So really, it's, it's no concern to me. Um, I just asked to, to want to see if, if any of the, you know, immediate butters who, who, you know, see that every day outside their window, 
if there even is anybody like that who can see that it's it's you know have they been informed do they know this is going on um is really kind of my my only concern to make sure that anybody who's in that immediate vicinity is kind of aware of uh of this proposal okay all right other questions well it seems to me we really have the real question that's before us is whether this is this a deemed to be a significant or not significant change. If we look at um, condition six, it says any significant alterations to building or landscapes uh, or changes in the management plan made necessary to result of changes in Massachusetts law um, shall be reviewed by the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. So um, question is, I guess, um, if we view this as insignificant, um, we can approve the change and allow the building department, uh, allow the plans to go before the building department uh, for, for final approval. And that does not have to come back to us. If we feel it's significant, we need to hold a, um, a public hearing on the matter and have public hearing and public meeting and make an amendment to the special permit. Um, my inclination is that this is not a significant change to the public, uh, to the, the building and why would I would be comfortable with allowing them to go forward to present the final plan to the building department for their approval. Um, and if they find that they think it's, um, it is significant in their judgment, they would bring it to our attention. So uh, that was my, my inclination in this. I'd certainly open that up to anybody else. And what I'd like to do then is to move that we do that and then open it up to that motion up to amendment for anybody else if they want to change that or if they want to discuss it. So unless there's any further questions, and there are none, I, I will move that we approve the request and seek a discussion, um, or maybe seek discussions on the, on the motion that we find this is, is not a significant change, approve the request from RISE for a mural, and that RISE submit the final design to the building department prior to installation. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that motion? So if you wish to amend the motion or if you wish to um, argue against it, this is the time to do that. Hearing no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to find that the mural is not a significant change, that we approve the request from RISE for a mural, and that RISE submit the final design to the building department prior to installation of the, uh, of, of the mural. This is a roll call, is, so, and this would be a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Ms. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. That's five ayes, uh, unanimous decision. Um, congratulations, good luck. Thanks a lot, good seeing everybody. Stay healthy. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. The next order of business is to conduct a public hearing on ZBA FY 2020-42. Chair? Yes. I'm sorry to bother you. Yeah. That's uh, all right. Uh, I, I believe uh, Mr. Tanell has now joined us if you wanna jump back. Um, and we, then we'd stay in the public meeting as opposed to opening the public hearing. Yeah, I think this might be a quicker. Yep. All right. We're going to return to the first order of business. Uh, hmm. um, is Mr. Tunnell there? He was here. Um, Hold on a second. Wait, there was uh, his. N Hold on. He's calling me. I'm sorry. All right. Hello. So if he's ready, we'll go with it. If not, uh, if this takes any period of time, we'll move to the last agenda item. What's the 
what we hear from him? Uh, he's joining us now. He was okay. a little he was a little confused. All right. So I'll restate what the uh, the application is. It's ZBA FY 2021-02, Bill and Carol Tunnell, Bill and Karen Tunnell, to review the updated site plan, building elevations, and floor plan pursuant to conditions one, two, and seven of the approved ZBA FY 2020-10 special permit, located at 1530 Southeast Street, map 26 b parcel three, outlying residential, RO, low density residential, RLD, and aquifer, aquifer recharge protection, ARP zoning districts. Um, are there any disclosures for this matter? For um, this application, we've received site plans, floor plans, landscape plans, lighting plans, and elevations for the special permit previously approved in 2019, and for what is being currently proposed. We have also received a management plan, a complaint response plan, and a lease. There was no um, site visit in this regard, so does the applicant wish to speak regarding the application? No. Uh, I do. This is, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I first let me apologize for not attending uh, earlier. Um, I I can only plead that I've I've been visiting Amherst for 30 days now, and uh, my brain is somewhere else from where it should be. So, um, uh, I uh, um, I'm able to uh, I'm on my phone because I don't have a computer, but I am looking at the the package that I submitted, uh, and Maureen has graciously told me that she can uh, share those exhibits as need be. Um, so uh, I, I can only uh, start by giving you a brief uh, outline of, of the changes that have occurred to our plans since we came before uh, your board last time. Uh, and they're actually quite minor. Um, the, the, the layout of the, the intended development is um, uh, essentially uh, unchanged except uh, for one key uh, aspect, and that is that um, in the previous plan, we had intended to build a new house that was going to be connected to the, a portion of the existing barn structure on the property with what we referred to as an, an, a connector, which would have been uh, a heated and cooled structure. Um, uh, for economic reasons, among others, we've chosen to eliminate that connector uh, and replace it effectively with uh, a simple covered outdoor porch. Um, so in the process, we've actually reduced the amount of lot and uh, building coverage on the lot uh, because that, that, that uh, connector footprint was reduced in size. Um, it was offset a, a bit by the other change, which is that we have expanded the parking pad uh, that so we had originally proposed. For one second? Sure. So, uh, if the board wants to look at uh, this elevation, the self elevation, this this was what was uh, approved last year in October okay. 2019, where uh, this is the house that connects to the barn. And if you go to the next slide. This is the proposed self elevation where uh, now it's a breezeway. So um, it, it ha it's connected by a roof with holes. And, and so this is open air. So that, that's the difference. So I'll show it again. Uh, this is uh, you know, a full building that connects the two structures. And then the next, the proposed is now a breezeway connecting the house to the to the barn, is that correct, Bill? Yes, and, and the space that uh, uh, was previously occupied by this connector structure that I was referring to, Maureen, uh, which is actually north of the, the, the open porch that you see in the revised uh, south elevation there, um, it, uh, uh, that, that footprint has been removed. And so there's a there's just a vacant space there that will now be uh, sort of a garden space. 
Uh, and so that's what I was referring to when I said that the actual coverage on the lot uh, has gone down because that footprint has gotten smaller. Um, it has been offset a bit by, if you look at the site plan, which was, I think, uh, one of the earlier exhibits, uh, you can see that the previous approved site plan had uh, essentially a square parking pad that was intended to accommodate two cars. Uh, and the board asked that we expand that pad to show that we could accommodate four uh, parking spaces outside of the garage structure that will also be there, and will, will, will house an additional two cars. So, so the revised site plan uh, illustrates that. And, the, and those two changes uh, combined, uh, if you look at the, um, the site plan that Randy Iser prepared, which uh, is earlier still in the sequence of drawings, uh, you can look at the changes there and you'll see that the, the coverage numbers and percentages have actually gone down from the original submittal. Otherwise, the, the footprints of the uh, of the, the buildings uh, and the intended uh, construction is is essentially uh, unchanged from what we had intended previously. So, what you, if if I read this correctly, is it Mr. Tanell? Is that correct? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Correct. Yes. Uh, so what you've done is it looks to me like you have taken out a, what was an originally a study and a bedroom, which was connected to the garage shop. And now you just have a covered porch there. And so you have air, more grassy area and less That's right. um, coverage. That's what, so I guess that'd be the approved floor plan against the proposed floor plan. Yeah. So this is where, this was the approved floor plan, what you're seeing now, it had, yeah, as, as Steve just mentioned, this is like the study, the bedroom, the connector, all this. And then if you compare, this is the proposed now, it's uh, a covered porch and courtyard. So we'll go back one more time. Oops. Yeah, and Maureen, if I may also point out that uh, the bedroom and study that you just described uh, was actually to have been in a portion of the existing barn, whole barn building. Um, mm -hmm. It occupied one bay of that of that structure and so in the revised site plan you'll see that that uh, the barn structure that will remain is instead of being an l shape uh, to include that those spaces it will only it will be just a simple rectangle uh, it will only be two bays wide east to west so so that that footprint has that's the effective re reduction in the footprint that i'm talking about sure and then if you go back and looking um, at, at the approved uh, sheet here, you can see the parking layout is, is, um, is smaller um, that it could accommodate two parking spots. Is that correct? And then now, that was the original, right. yeah, and now this is a larger parking uh, area that can accommodate um, at least four cars. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And the, again, the, the intent there was uh, when we when we got this approved initially, it was with the, the provision that we could in the future build an accessory dwelling or actually improve the existing small structure that's at the front of the lot uh, that was originally built as a milking parlor. Um, and that can uh, is, is approved to become an accessory dwelling. And for that reason, we needed two additional parking spaces on the site. And so the site plan now shows that that, that is not only possible, but that that, that improvement will be made uh, when, we, uh, when we do the initial construction of the house. Okay. And then the other proposed change is, um, not change, but you added a apron onto uh, the, the curb cut? That's right, yes. Um, you, at your suggestion, Maureen, we, we have shown that the driveway will include, uh, you know, a flared apron that, that conforms to the, the town's requirements uh, for 
an eight foot radius on the inboard inbound side and a 12 foot radius on the outbound side of the driveway. So this was the original plan. Um, uh, the, the curb cut onto Southeast Street looked like this. And one of the conditions said that the applicant needed to uh, provide an apron onto the street uh, before um, got their certificate about occupancy, I believe. Um, so uh, Bill Tanell is meeting that condition. I, I forget which condition number that is, but um, that is one of the listed conditions for your review. So now, now that he has uh, met that radii requirement. Um, are you done with your presentation? Is this a good time to start asking questions, Mr. Tanell? Yes, I believe that covers it. I'm happy to answer any questions. So I was out at the site today just to look at it. Um, and am I correct that the existing, there's a red building that is closest to Southeast Street. Is that the, the what you call the milk barn? Is that what you're going to incorporate as the um, supplemental, as the, the cottage? Is this designated yes. here? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's correct. The other thing I noticed is that there's a lot of um, old hardscape, cement, aggregate, mm -hmm. asphalt, right. and a, a right. lot of areas. Um, are you, yes. I'm assuming that you're going to take up a lot of that hardscape and that if it isn't needed for either the driveway or the parking areas, is that correct? That is exactly correct. That All of that uh, paving that you're referring to is on the south side uh, of the barn. Um, which in, I guess, in the drawings that you're looking at would be on the left to the left. Um, mm -hmm. And so what, what you're seeing in, uh, if, if you're looking at Randy Iser's site plan, for example, it shows a paved area that will remain uh, as part of our finished improvements that is 16 feet by 36 feet. Uh, and that is actually a portion yep. of that concrete um, apron that you know is in there that was built to you know for the all the agricultural equipment that used to go in and out and so all the rest of that pavement is going to come up uh, okay. and we want to keep that one piece just because we're trying to preserve the agricultural character of the, the existing buildings and you know i just like i sort of like that old pavement i think it's kind of cool thank you Do board members have other, do other board members have questions? Um, if not, uh, I guess I just have one last question. Before you get your building permit, um, you would need to submit final details on um, materials and detailing from the, the building beyond what's here in the um, uh, the plan that you've that you've provided us. I assume uh, additional right. additional right, and you you know that, that you correct. have to yeah. do that. Right. So this is this is um, not this is not final, but it was what was uh, it's good enough for our for our purposes tonight, and then you'll have to provide more spe specifics to the building department, correct? That's, it. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, happy to answer any questions you might have about those elevation drawings that you're looking at, because I think those are you know, pre pretty accurate in terms of what we intend uh, to have as a, as a final product. But, you know, I, I can speak to the materials and I will certainly do that in, in the, the construction drawings that we will submit uh, when we get ready to go to permit, which hopefully will be in the next 60 days. Well, I think for our purposes, um, you've given us enough information. The building department can look at that for co meeting code and, and uh, safety issues. So that's, that's not really okay. what we have to deal with here. So, uh, okay. but uh, people could ask questions about it if they like, but I don't think that's germane to what we have to deal with tonight. Understood. All right. Um, last chance for questions or comments. If not, then uh, I move the board approve the updated site plan. One. Oh, Mr. Langsdale. Yes. <laughs> Didn't see you. Okay. Um, on the east elevation, 
uh, from the October 10th, 2019, there mm -hmm. are, uh, let me go back a second. You, you have in your proposal, uh, the one that was approved, uh, lighting plans uh, that are um, dark sky, medium base, uh, outdoor wall lights, um, three watt uh, bronze low voltage uh, hardwired path light, uh, and then a Kitchler 310117, which I'm not sure where that's supposed to go. I think under a, um, on, on the deck or something under the overhang. But on that's the, right. yes. on, on the east elevation, you mm -hmm. show three carriage style lights, which are not mm -hmm. dark sky compliant. Okay. I would, I would say that, I don't know, do we make a recommendation that those have to be replaced with dark sky compliant lights? I mean, we're not doing conditions here. Um, you tell me. It seems to me that um, it's it, the spirit of what we would, would intend would be that these all are dark sky compliant um, on the side. Um, and Mr. Tunnell, would you um, represent to us that you intend to put dark sky compliant um, light fixtures on that east elevation for those three wall wall mounted lights. Absolutely, and um, I, those, those uh, as you can see, are, are you know essentially representations of a fixture that had not been selected at the time that it was drawn, um, and and so I will I will make sure that that we select one that that can be compliant. Absolutely. Okay. So so I think we can um, if we move to approve this, we can say instruct the uh, building department to make sure that those are dark sky compliant. Maureen. Um, I'm reviewing the, the previously approved special permit uh, for this uh, project and condition 23 uh, specifically says that all exterior lighting shall be um, dark sky compliant. So uh, the building inspectors uh, when reviewing the building permit application will be We'll be referring to all the conditions that are listed in the special permit app, uh, special permit decision to ensure that um, the applicant um, meets those requirements. So and so that's a, a condition not affected by the um, motion today. We only no. have one, two, and seven, not twenty-two. So that would remain in effect. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay, I think that answers your question, doesn't it, Mr. Langsdale? Yeah, only that th this this. Uh, this was approved a year, not quite a year ago, with these on there, and nothing has been done to change the what is presented on the elevation. So I would just like something, a note to uh, the uh, permitting uh, people that they need to be changed to dark sky compliant. That these specifically are not, although there is a condition that says everything has to be, what it has been approved is not. So I would like to make sure that that gets changed. Okay. All right. Okay. Any further questions? Comments? All right. If there are no, I move the board approve the updated site plan, building elevation, and floor plan pursuant to conditions. One, two, and seven of the approved ZBA FY 2020 10 special permit, and that we um, indicate the need, indicate to the building department that all lights, that they check for all lights to be dark sky compliant and consistent with the bylaws of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion on that motion? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I gotta come back. Uh, I, I think what you're saying is that they have to be dark sky compliant, but I think there needs to be a note in there that what was approved on the, the east elevation, they are not dark sky compliant and that they need to be changed 
to be dark sky compliant. I think we need to specifically say that what was approved does not uh, adhere to the condition and that it needs to be changed. But isn't, but isn't that, um, maybe David could help us with this, but isn't that if it's required in the condition 22, that they be dark sky compliant or 23, uh, if, they, if, they, if it's already in a condition, then that, that the building inspector must look at that and, and enforce that. Mr. Waskevich, can you help us with that? Yeah, I wanted to jump in. So um, one thing we do look at is meeting notes, like even from tonight. So Maureen, if you could put some notes specific to that topic. Um, but we also do look at the conditions like was mentioned earlier. But I'm sitting here, I understand, as long as I'm still in the office, I will make, try to make sure that that happens. So Maureen, put that as a note into the meeting. Um, and we're We'll, they'll still have to abide by the by um, condition 22 and by the instruction from the in the motion we made that they all be dark sky compliant in uh, accord with the ZBA rules and regulations. I think we got it for you, Keith. I think that's what you, you want. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure, yeah. Ms. Uh, Parks. Ms. Parks, you had your hand up. Or were you just signaling? Three. It's 23. 23. <laughs> 23. Thanks for the correction. All right. Okay, um, any further comments on the motion? If not, this is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Um, congratulations, Mr. Tunnell. Aye. Good luck. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of your service. We now move to the public hearing. Um, we have one item left in the public hearing. That's ZBA FY 2020-42. Faye Crosby requests a special permit to allow a non-owner occupied duplex under sections 3.3211 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 65 High Street, map 14B, parcel 90, general residential RG zoning district. Are there any disclosures? I could not attend the site visit, but I did stop by the property today to view it. Um, who is there and can give us a, a summary of the site visit questions asked and um, comments made? I was there. Okay, Mr. Meadows. Yeah. We, we walked the site, the exterior of the site. We were told about where the new parking spaces were intended to go. Um, that there would be some removal of some trees, cypress from the looks of them that would uh, permit new parking area to go in. Um, we were told that the uh, downstairs apartment came along with the front bedroom of the upstairs apartment. So that the front bedroom was not part, uh, upstairs was not part of that apartment. And so consequently the downstairs apartment essentially is three bedrooms and the upstairs apartment is four bedrooms. Um, it was noted that um, there are three utility meters attached to the building. Uh, the um, person who gave us the tour did not know what those three meters hooked up to. He told us that there are only two panels in the basement and that the panel out in the garage is a sub panel. We don't, we don't at this point have an idea of what that third utility meter would be attached for or used for. To my mind, there's a little bit of confusion within that context as to whether there is the probability of another apartment being contained in the building. That's something that 
confused me to some degree. Does anybody else have other specific things? Keith? I do, thank you. Um, uh, we walked, as we said, we walked all the way around the house. Uh, we looked at the stairway to the second and third floor, the, which is outside on the building, which had been put on, I presume not that long ago, it was uh, approved um, as a special permit. Um, there were three mailboxes and uh, uh, as, as he said, the three electric meters on the outside. Um, the parking, what we uh, saw when we got there was that there were three uh, cars parked in the driveway itself, well, two cars parked in the driveway, one right behind the house, uh, nosing up to those uh, trees that uh, uh, constitute a, a break there. Um, none of the cars, while the, the, the parking um, plan says that there are three in the garage and one uh, around the side where the trees will be taken out. There were no cars parked in the garages. Uh, one of the doors in the middle, we were told, has a, 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 a door opener, automatic door opener. The other two do not, and therefore they are manually operated. We also noticed that there was damage to the door in the middle and that it, on the bottom and that it needs repair or replacement. Um, we were told that the trash and the recycling, I presume, would be inside the mid door of the garage, but that brought, brings up the question of, well, will there be room for a vehicle there? Um, we were not uh, shown inside the garage, so we did not see uh, any of that. Um, the, let's see, we were told where the proposed, uh, for the fourth car was, and that's now been shown on the parking plan that's been submitted recently. Uh, the lighting, the side porch, uh, the south side porch, there's a carriage, uh, type light under the roof of the first floor and under the second floor. It was hard to see what kind of light it was, but it, it certainly did not seem to be dark sky compliant. Uh, nothing has been said about those two places where lights are. And the front porch has a carriage style, which is not, not dark sky compliant, which is uh, under the roof of the front porch. Um, and that's, I think, all I have in terms of the site visit. I think there was Anybody one else? where there was one other thing that was mentioned. Um, Maureen had asked about snow removal and the person who gave us a tour around didn't have any real indication of what, where the snow went. But I would have assumed that the snow would be compacted where those cypress trees were. I don't see any other spot to put that much snow. Um, it, the, the driveway is pretty close to the property line. So the, there, there still is, I believe, a question of what would they, what do they do with the snow? If they, if they put the fourth parking space in that area where I assume they put the snow now. Okay. Um, Let me go through what we've received in submissions from the applicant. Um, she submitted a request for a list of certified list of abutters, a site plan that was uh, done by a surveyor in 1989, a letter from the surveyor from March 2020, floor plans for the basement, first, second, and third floor, photographs of the building's exterior, an amended management plan, uh, photographs of light fixtures, an updated parking plan a complaint response form, a sample lease, an updated survey um, site plan dated July 11th, 2020, and photographs of the interior of the building. Um, I think that's what, everything we have, isn't it, Maureen? No other submissions from the applicant.
All right. Um, who wishes to speak for the applicant? Hello, I'm Faye Crosby. I am the applicant. Um, and your address, Faye, Ms. Crosby? My current address where I live? Yep, yes. Uh, currently, I live at 1127 Cialito Court in Seaside, California, 93955. Okay, go ahead. Well, um, I'll try to be brief because I know that your time is very uh, scarce. Um, and, I'll, and I also have to warn you that I've been having technical difficulties. Maureen probably saw me dropping on and off and on and off. Uh, we've had ash falling on our uh, distributors here in California. So sometimes I seem to just lose the internet. And um, Kevin Cook, who is on, as you can see, you can't see his face. Kevin um, uh, will take over for me and indeed I'll be passing it over to him. So I'd like to um, break this into four parts. First, thanks. A thanks to you all. A thanks for what you're doing. A thanks for preserving the spirit and beauty and wonderful nature of Amherst and for your service that you're doing. A thanks to Kevin, who is my property manager and I'm really grateful to Kevin for everything that he's done. And a big thanks to Maureen, who has worked with me. Um, we started in February, Rob Mora in February sent me over to Maureen and through COVID and other um, challenges, I've, I'm very, very grateful for your help at every moment. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is to uh, make a slight correction and give a little bit of information. Um, so a slight correction is a, about the interior of the house. Indeed, it's not three and four, it's four and four bedrooms. The, let's um, not talk about floors, but let's talk about uh, apartment A and apartment B. Apartment A covers three bedrooms on the first floor and one bedroom on the second floor. Apartment B has two bedrooms on the second floor and two bedrooms on the third floor. Uh, apartment A has two, um, two uh, restrooms, bathrooms, and apartment B has three, uh, I beg your pardon, apartment A first has uh, three bathrooms and apartment B has two bathrooms. Uh, and then um, I don't know why there are three mailboxes. That's news to me. There should really only be two mailboxes. Currently apartment B has four young ladies living in it. They're, they're students in a, one of the colleges and apartment A um, might have tenants in it if you say I can have it be non-owner occupied but I've reserved it for myself uh, as the owner. However, due to COVID and some ill health, I can't get there uh, until COVID allows, until I feel safe to drive or fly uh, there. So, um, so I've said my thanks, I've said a little bit of correction and um, or supplementing of the information. And then let me give you some context and then turn it over to, um, let me give you some context and then uh, say one other part and then turn it over to Kevin. So the context is why, how did this all come about? And again, I'll try to be very brief. In 1994, I bought that house at 65 High Street. I lived there with my younger son uh, till 1998. In 1998, I moved to California for a job um, offer that came along. My younger son went off to college. My older son graduated from college. I, during that one year, I kept the house and my younger son and I had lived in one apartment and rented. And when we bought the house from the Tans, uh, there were many students living in the other apartment. That was very helpful to us um, financially to start with. Then over the time that we were living there, sometimes we lived in the whole house. Then we moved to the upstairs and we rented out the downstairs. And then when I came to California and Tim went to college, I rented out both apartments and did so in the belief that I was complying with the law. 
I then sold the house to some people named Seth Kupferschmidt and Meg Bouvier. Seth and Meg made um, some changes in their life. They got divorced and then Meg made some changes in the house. And so Maureen has uh, told me and shared with me many of the applications that Meg has made and she moved the staircase from one place to another. Then uh, Meg was making more changes in her life and I and the real estate gods had smiled upon me in California and I decided I wanted to buy the house back again. My purpose in buying it back or my intention was that I had um, at one point when my when my elder boy graduated from Amherst College, we slept 20 people in that house that night. We had a lot of people, aunts and uncles visiting. It's a wonderful house for gatherings. And I um, had intended to give it to a not-for-profit. So I was, gonna, uh, I was gonna move out to Amherst. I was gonna retire from my work here, go out there and come back to that house. Uh, my health took a left turn and everything changed. And I was the owner of the house, but I had no ability to, to, um, to get out there. So at that point, I had a property manager named Scott Goldman, and Scott made a change in his life, and he uh, told me about Kevin Cook. Kevin is an individual. He's not a firm who does property management, but Kevin knows the house intimately. He has worked on it many, many times. Now, since I bought it in 1998, and I, do I need to, Go ahead. No, okay, just, since I bought it in let's, 1998. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's, let's okay. understand your plans. For yeah. Now. Yep. Okay, when, since I bought it, I've been to the house for two hours. So my understanding of some things is a little out of date and foggy. I went to put the house on the market after the um, certain things happened. And when I put it on the market, the realtor said, this says owner-occupied. I then learned that owner-occupied meant that I was supposed to be living in one of the apartments. And I had had both of them rented out. As soon as the leases were done, I made sure that I only had people in one apartment. Um, the uh, reason that it might be good to have it be non-owner-occupied is that um, it, it opens up the possibility of it being bought by an investor who would then have somebody living in each of the apartments. Uh, I don't believe that that would change the nature of the town or the neighborhood, but that's your determination to make. Uh, I um, am grateful again that you all do what you do. I have loved the town of Amherst and I think you help to keep the character of the town of Amherst. At this point, what I would really love is clarity. Uh, Kevin and I have worked hard, all the site plans and many different things. Maureen has yes, given yes, hours of yes, service. Yes, and so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we just clarify the situation. And of course, I hope you clarify it for it to be non-owner occupied, but um, whatever it, you decide, I know, will be made in good conscience and for the good of the town. Uh, I don't know if you need any more information from Kevin, but as you can see, he's here and prepared to give you more information if you need it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but first, the first question I have is I'm confused about um, the number of apartments for each unit. You said that the first floor has is has three bedrooms, one of the and the second floor. One of the bedrooms in the second floor goes with the first. And which which we're looking at um, a drawing. Do you have a do you have the um, the uh, existing conditions drawing? I'm pulling it up. Okay. So this is the first floor. Oops. And it has. One, two, three bedrooms. The three bedrooms. First floor, and so this is the second floor. So which bedroom? Which bedroom belongs to unit A? So the Drawing bedroom a. is marked bedroom number one is the bedroom that belongs to unit A.
Um, and then you, then you have two other bedrooms up on the third floor that belong That's to unit B. So one, two, wait, one, two, and then you go to the next page. Yep, next page. One, two, three, four. So bedroom four and bedroom five, you say belong to you, dwelling okay. B. Yes. So I apologize but, that I can see how this is confusing because when the um, plans were made up, uh, they were labeled for the floors of the of the building, sure. but um, it, uh, if we were to label it for clarity, um, and and starting here at the third floor, and then Maureen, I hope you'll go back to the second and the first floor. I would I would call what's unit bedroom unit five. I would call that B four bedroom unit four. I would call that B three. Mm -hmm. Then if we go to the second floor. What's labeled? What's what's? No, I understand. A, I think we understand that that okay. you you're just taking two out, but um, you have the, the way to get to bedroom one on the second floor. If you're part of you, part of dwelling A, right? Is you go yeah. out, you go up the stairs, where you could go enter directly into the living room of unit of apartment yeah what's what is the is there a wall I, if you room on the second floor looks to be open to the stairway okay so and again um this is uh, i believe that i am telling you the truth but then i hope that if i have a mistaken memory that <laughs> heaven would correct me so when you go up the stairs you have a choice and you're on level two you have a choice. You could go into apartment B through its living room, exactly like that, or you could go to bedroom number four of unit A that way. So is, what is the, is there a wall? We, we, we weren't able to get in. I don't think the, the board, I know the board wasn't able to get in and, and observe this. And I don't remember seeing the details on the photographs, the interior photographs that you sent. But is there a doorway, or is that an open space? Is it locked for only it, for only uh, uh, residents of apartment B, for lack of a better term, or so is it open? It is a French door, uh, a glass French door, that leads onto the stairwell. Yeah. That it's not there. Don't think, we don't have a picture of that. I'm sorry. Is this is this it? Is this where the is this the French door here? This looks like the second floor middle living room, which would be that yes. living room twelve by fourteen. Beyond that curtain, you see the curtain yes. there? If you yeah. were to open the curtain, you would have French doors that go out to the landing. Okay. It seems all right. And then the second question I have, so the second question I have is on the third floor. It, it looks to me like there is, the, we got a third floor, a living room area. Um, and it appears, I don't know what's behind the purple shade. Uh, I think Mr. Cook said that that was used as a background for Zoom meetings or something. But what I'm impressed with is that number one, that picture seems to show a bed in the living room on the third floor. If you go back to that picture, Maureen, over to the right hand side of that picture against the wall over around the, exactly, that appears to be a bed. Certainly the layout would be um, useful. At, you could use it as a bedroom up on the third floor. And even if we, even if you accept that the fourth bedroom for the for unit A is on the second floor, and the rest are on the third floor. Up on the on on the second, there's three on for unit A. There's three on one and one on two, and for unit B, there's two on two, and there looks to be easily could be three on two. And this the living room could easily be a bedroom, um, and could be used by students. And that's and you're only allowed four 
bedroom, four unrelated people in a um, in each dwelling unit. So it's I'm concerned that we what we have here is um, an undeclared bedroom, and that students would use it um, and uh, use it as a bedroom, quite frankly. So I'm I'm concerned about that, Miss Crosby, and of course we can't we. I don't think we would waive the, um, the, the zoning bylaw requirement that allows you to have more than the zoning bylaw allows for residents for each unit. You're not allowed. You can't I, I, We can't do it. Yeah, we can't do it. Yeah, well, so that, that's troublesome for me. Um, do you understand? Yes. So um, I understand that it is troublesome. Um, I'm... Um, I have to say my eyesight is not so great as to be able to see exactly what you're seeing. I see the bl I see that, but I it's don't know that. Oh, yeah. yes. It's a bed. Yeah. So I, I was trusting the young women. Um, there's one young woman named Sarah, who is the, uh, they all four of them have signed a lease with me. There are four mm -hmm. people on the lease. And um, after your visit and the concerns that were relayed to Kevin and to Maureen, and then to me, I um, called Sarah and I said, what's up? And she said that uh, this curtain, and I, I believe that Kevin Cook communicated this to you, the curtain is because there are four students with four different agendas at Mount Holyoke College, and they're all trying to do their Zoom and they're trying to not hear each other. And they're, uh, the, what made, it, uh, made the apartment attractive to them was the two uh, living rooms or study spaces that could be separated. Um, uh, I asked, is there a fifth person living there? And she said, no, there is not. I, I think college kids are college kids, so I, hope there's not a fifth person living there yeah. and i would trust that there's not but um what you've but that's one of the pro yeah, yeah that's 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 difficult for you to ascertain if you're in you're not an owner occupant and that's one of the concerns that we have right yep um, i can do that i have some more questions but i know mr maxfield had raised his hand go ahead yeah i was just thinking about um you know i know at least every other day I'll see a posting in a, you know, the UMass Facebook group for um, somebody looking to rent out the living room of Puffton apartment or in the boulders or something like that. Um, so I know that's certainly not allowed in the boulders or, or uh, Puffton, but it still happens anyways. Um, I, I, I guess uh, my question would be uh, to you, Mr. Chair, you know, what, what is really kind of our responsibility here to to prevent something like this and kind of what is our authority to do that because uh, I, I certainly would believe a landlord acting in good faith um, to not want uh, to be in violation of having more people in there. I, I certainly don't think it's being advertised that way. So I guess what what would we we want to get at to to prevent something like that if we still wanted to approve this? What what's kind of our, our recourse here? I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to, our, our reason for a denial to be a fear of, of them violating the terms of their lease, uh, which, which at that point is really on, on the tenant. Um, I, I guess well, it's hear from I understand what, what you, I understand what you, I understand your point and your question. Um, you know, and, and generally you wouldn't raise, generally you wouldn't have a concern, uh, but for the, with most places, but for the fact that this is such a convenient, um, um, and we see evidence of additional of an additional bed, and it'd be very convenient and easy for this to happen, especially if you're not there to monitor it. Um, and so I think that our 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 ability in this case to to make sure that we don't approve a, um, a dwelling unit that is so attractive to students that they easily could violate the zoning bylaws with having too many people in it is to one, say that you have to um, have building inspector come by and make sure that each of the room, rooms are being used uh, as, they are, as they are designated on the plans. And that would require, um, you have to require them, the building inspector 
to be able to go in and look and verify that at various times. And that is something that we don't typically do, but we don't typically also um, grant permits for uh, special permits for um, units that can easily be over, over um, um, populated, for lack of a better term. So you'd have to have some kind, you'd have to have the agreement on the part of the landlord and the inspection services to go and inspect them and make sure that it's not being used. And you'd have to be able to do that for my satisfaction. You'd want to have to be able to do that um, more than just before um, leasing. And so you can see it when in, in real time. So that's why I think that's the only way we could do it, Mr. Maxfield. Maureen, is that, um, is that about right, Mr. Westkevich? Is there any other way to deal with that? Well, we generally don't inspect duplexes. And if this is truly yeah. a duplex, that's not something we'd be doing. But another thing I'm noticing is this house is not really set up as a duplex. And you've got a shared um, doorway in the stairwell there. That yeah. should be fire separated between the units. Because right now, you're, you're right that somebody could easily go into the other apartment. And maybe it's locked, but that door in itself has glass in it. So that does not protect the occupants of the upper unit if there should be truly a fire. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit more code review on this house just to yeah. create a duplex itself. And is there a second egress from that second floor? If that, well, they, they go out the back, the back stairway, yeah. And they share the stairs. Yep, they share the stairs. I can see. Yep. Um, Mr. Langsdale. Chairman, a uh, couple things. Um, with that, um, where we're talking about the second floor with the, between the living room and the bedroom with the glass doors, the, the thing is that, of course, that even though it may be locked um, from the uh, bedroom, <laughs> bedroom four of apartment A, that cuts off the, e the second egress for the people in uh, apartment B. Uh, there is then only the outside staircase. So there is then, therefore, if that door is locked, there's no second egress for the people in apartment B. Um, if it's not locked, then it's open to uh, people going into the bathroom and or the bedroom there. So, and and nothing that we have received beyond the comments, uh, the verbal comments, says that that bedroom and bathroom belong to apartment A. There's nothing in the management plan or nothing that we've received. The other thing is in the lease agreement, there is nothing. It says that there shall be no more than four uh, uh, Unrelated people living in any unit, uh, an overnight guest may be present for no more than three consecutive nights unless less, lesser gives written permission. But there's no consequence if, in fact, they rent that living room as a bedroom, which it seems it, they have because there's a bed in there. Uh, I'm not sure even, I, I think that purple curtain covers the, um, the, uh, the, entrance into the hallway, as far as I can see. Um, so, and, and the, the third, picture- the On the picture, third floor, right, Mr. Langston? On the third floor. And the third floor we, living room on the floor plan doesn't actually match the picture that we received because there's a half wall. In the picture, you can see there's a half wall uh, where that curtain is, and there is no half wall on this. So, yeah. Yeah. so this is this is not a correct representation of that living room, and the fact that we haven't been able to get in to see this place, I think is I think it's important that before what? we can uh, vote on this, I think we need we need to be in there and see it. I've talked. I, I, I've been on other ones where we've been in several times where um, the uh, rooms were uh, uh, rented out that were not bedrooms at all. And we had to finally clear that out. But, um, but it's incumbent upon us to make sure that, that this is followed 
that these are followed, specifically also because if it's going to be too uh, not, if it's going to be non-occupied, owner-occupied, uh, we have to, it has to be very clear about what areas belong to which apartment, how many people, what the bedrooms are, and what the other living spaces, what their use is. That has to be mm -hmm. very clearly delineated so that if something does come up, then there's a, there's a standard to which you can measure what you find if it's a, uh, uh, against uh, what that, uh, what we've said that it, uh, what its use is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mr. Waskevitz, um, can I ask you a question? I know that for a duplex, it's normally either side by side or one on top of the other. Is there provision to allow a duplex to be partially one on top of the other? So this kind of formation where you have unit A, unit A on the first floor and one part of the second floor and unit B on the second floor and, and all the third? Yes, it is doable. It's a little more complicated with how it has to be fire separated. But yeah. the other concern I do have is the shared stairway because the yeah. egress as pointed out is within the other apartment. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it, some changes need to be made, I think, in order to make this a true duplex. Yeah. Mr. Meadows. Uh, let me ask also, it doesn't appear as though there's a second egress from the third floor area? Yeah, yeah that's not required. All that is required is the bedrooms have egress windows. Are they? Egress size. Well, I guess we wouldn't know if they're egress windows until somebody inspects them. That is correct. Yeah, so we, we can't answer that question at this point. But a good one, Mr. Meadows, thank you. Um, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, I, I think I'm looking at the, the right photo here. I, I could be wrong. Um, the one that appears to have that, that staircase on the side of the building, I have to go back one more. Um, now go back to the original drawing. Oh, oh the drawing. I want to go. Uh, uh, the floor plan you want to look at? Yeah, that one right there. Because oh, yeah. um, I have one of the photos in the packet that, I, I don't know if this has been, been updated or this is an out of date photo, but it, it appears that there's only one small window that would be where the wall is. Am I, am I looking at the, the correct one? I have show a, the photo here that I'm looking at. Oh, uh, yeah. Is that um, early on? Um, hold on a second. I've... An out of date photo? Yeah, hold on a second. Uh, uh, Faye submitted this as part of her application. Give me a minute. I'm trying to. I think it was exterior photos. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the front. This is the side. So this is the northerly side where the driveway is. Mm -hmm. And then this You're is- looking at page 16? Yes. And then this is the southerly side. Uh, and you, uh, one more photo. I don't know which photo you want me to look at. Uh, 16, I think is the, the number. Oh, you want, okay. This so one. If you go down one more. Down. Oh, right. oh, this. This? Nope, keep no. going. Oh, sorry. This? Yeah, more? right okay. there. There. Yeah. I'll flip it. Oh, There's only one window on that side. Uh, was this um, outdated photos? Uh, I did, hold on, if we bear with me, I did take photos. Yeah. Uh, on the egress from the third floor, if there is, if those windows are egress windows, how, once you get out of them, it doesn't appear as though there's any way to get down once you get out, even after you open the window. That is correct. As a one or two family, you're only required to have egress size windows and then you would have to be assisted. You're not expected to be able to walk all the way down. So it's that, different that, as an apartment building. Oh, that, that's the code for, for Amherst, huh? That's the state building code. State building code. Ms. Parks, you had your hand up. 
I was going to say that window, I think, is on the second floor. Um, because if you look at the second floor picture, there's only the one small window. And then the third floor has two windows. Okay. So that's, yep. I understand. So I don't think we have yeah. a photo of that uh, floor. Thank you. Um, also, it looks like, um, oh, if you bear with me, it looks like uh, the photo that Faye had submitted is outdated. Um, bear with me for one second. There. This. This is the side. I think this. Um, this is the side of the house. Um, this is the yeah. So this is the side of the house. Uh, this is like oddly uh, shaped here. This is the front door. Uh, and this doesn't show stairs, but then if you go back to the apple packet, it has stairs. I, I oh, no, this is the other side. Yeah, you're right. This is the other side. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I confused myself. So I, I think we've got some, what's helpful about this process is that we're identifying issues that should be reviewed by the uh, building inspector and be reviewed by us. Um, so there's, there, I think there's several issues that we want to get um, some more uh, information on before we make any decision on this. Another set of issues involved parking. I was there today and that, there were four cars parked on the driveway. Um, I don't know. And um, I, if they can park in the garage, that would mean if they are using the garage, that would mean there's up to seven cars on that, that um, parking on that property when what we've talked about is four. So are those, do you know if those, that garage is empty and is it, are, is it available for three cars to park in it? And is there sufficient room for the trash to be held, held there for eight people and still have a car in, the, in, the, in one of the bays? So I'm gonna have to ask Kevin to answer that because I haven't been in the house. But before yeah. he answers that, I also, um, uh, um, said another, forgot to tell you about another thing, which is the, the electrical, apparently there are three meters. What I was told when I bought the house back then in 2018 was that one of the meters uh, is for the outside lighting and the, um, any lighting that happens in the garage, which is also a barn. The reason that that existed separate from the other two meters, I was told, is that Meg Bouvier at one point had hoped to develop the barn into something. She did a fair amount of work so that there would be um, electrical work. I have no desire to develop the barn into anything other than a parking space and storage space, and uh, tra including trash storage and other storage. So um, the bills that I received over the two years that I've owned the house would be consistent with that explanation. One of them was $7 a month. So $7 a month would have been the outside electrical use. And then there's a, another unit, uh, there's unit A and unit B, electrical. Uh, okay. But um, I, I'm, again, I'm, I believe that everything that I'm telling you is true, but uh, I, it's a belief and it's not substantiated with in-depth visit and knowledge. Okay, thank you. That means it could be for common undivided uh, electricity that's for the use of the owner. It could be, um, I think that's something we should have to verify. Yeah. Other questions or comments, concerns, Ms. Parks? Um, I, so I did have a question about the driveway because it seems to me that's the obvious place to park. And when we went for the site visit, we parked in the driveway. And so I guess I need to ask Maureen and David if, if there is, do, do they need to park in the garage? I mean, is they, are they not allowed to park on that driveway if they parked on one side of the driveway? Which is what it was. It had one car parked behind the house and then like three or four in a row on the side of the driveway. I will say that in, for me, looking at the garage, the garage has not been used in a very long time. And I, 
um, either the doors would have to be changed or removed or something. I don't know how people would drive up and expect, you know, open those doors to park there. So is that, I mean, are, are they allowed? Um, is there a certain width that it has to be in order to park it in a driveway? Yes. So there was, uh, looking at the, the submitted site plan, there was a question whether there, it, the driveway itself was wide enough for cars to park and, uh, and for, um, for uh, enough room to turn around. Um, but, but the site visit did um, indicate there is enough room. Um, I mean, it, it does look like there's cars sort of parking at the edge of one side of the driveway um, to accommodate cars to pass. <clears throat> you know, it appeared to me when I looked at it today that the cars were parked with part of the tire on grass and off the hard surface and that it would be a, they would be able, a car would be able to pass by them barely. It's tight, but barely pass by them. I didn't measure it. I think there's a, I think there's a, a width requirement in, and I'm, I'm not, I don't have that on off the top of my head, but that is something that has to be examined because I'm not sure it's really wide enough for parking at that place, Ms. Parks. And how many, um, so if they had uh, four, four uh, people living in each dwelling, what's the number of parking spaces they need to have? Is it eight? No, they need to have two per unit, two per dwelling unit. So, so they need to have four as a minimum. I would just say that for me, looking at the parking situation, adding the new parking space, kind of going caddy corner and having to take down bushes and almost having it drive in the backyard, to me, seemed very awkward. I, I mean, I'd, I'd rather see people parked along the driveway than creating this odd parking space in the backyard. So I just, I'm just throwing that out that I'm, you know, if, if it's okay for people to park along the driveway, that's Chairman. more sense to yep. me than adding extra parking space. Mr. Langsdale. Uh, as I understand it, the issue here is that the driveway to have parking on it has to be at least 18 feet wide. The driveway, as far as we know, is not 18 feet wide. That's something that needs to be determined. They're not allowed, given that we're, that what, what is before us is to an application to make this a non-occupied owner uh, apartment uh, complex, uh, they're not allowed to park on grass. So right. the, the fact that they're, and then the other thing is if you've got four people parking in the garage and the back places, um, and you've got two or three cars parking along the, uh, the driveway, what happens if a fire comes on or there's an emergency? Can an emergency vehicle get past them? That's, uh, that's something that we have to uh, know for sure. Uh, it's not about, well, they can park a little closer this way or that way. If it's going to be a non-owner occupied, it has to be to the, the code. And the part of the problem is that no one, at least who's there now, has an incentive to park in the garage because two of the doors are manual. The other one is, uh, uh, I don't know if anybody has the uh, door uh, for that, the clicker, whatever you call it. Uh, but uh nobody's parking in there um and then there's a the question of is there enough room once with the trash barrels and stuff in there um it, it seems to me that if we're going to look at this as a non-owner occupied place that the uh parking has to be delineated and dealt with and um it can't be just willy-nilly anywhere in the in the driveway, um, unless they want to look at uh, can they widen the driveway enough given where it is next to the property line. Uh, I don't know that at this point, uh, but that's uh, certainly something that they could look at. The other question I have is Mr. Cook is listed as the uh, designated contact person, and. Um, it just has his name and his telephone number. So the question 
I have is, is that 24 hours, seven days a week? Uh, if it's not, where, who's the secondary uh, person, uh, designated person to contact? You know, I, those are good questions. Is there an answer? Is Mr. Cook, your sole de designated contact person, Ms. Crosby? So um, I, again, started this process in, in yeah. uh, a long time ago. I, I thought that I had given several names. I'd given Kevin Cook as the primary, and I thought that I gave the name of Maureen, pa of, um, I beg your pardon, Marilyn Patton as yes. a secondary. Um, so in the unlikely event that uh, Kevin would be unable to get there, there was another number that people can uh, get to. Um, I have some questions that I'd like to ask too, when when it's appropriate. Okay. Um, just in just a second. Um, are there any other questions from the board? I do have a question. That may and, we, and there's also an also opportunity for public comment. I think. Yes, Mr. Meadows. Uh, the half bath on the second floor. Um, there are two. Do access doors to it, which seems to me makes it more available or as available to the other apartment as it is to the bedroom itself. Indeed. Is there a different um, rationale for that? Yeah. So um, at the time that, that I had that, again, with all the permits that were needed in 1996 or 8, somewhere in there. Um, we put that bath in and, and that's when we put in again um, with all the permits, it was a, it was a duplex at that time. Um, I wanted to have this be, uh, um, to have versatility in it. So you obviously don't want strangers coming into your bathroom, but the way to deal with that is to lock the door. And so it, it is a bath that is accessible from the bedroom and it is accessible from the landing area. Uh, when, when you don't, when you want the people in this second floor bedroom, uh, part of bedroom B to not have access, uh, you lock off that other door um, and uh, I hadn't envisioned what you would want to do if you didn't want people to get in from the bedroom. So it can be, um, uh, at one point, I had use of the entire house. It was a single family house with a couple of kitchens in it. And at that point, uh, it made sense to have access through a second door into that bathroom, not simply have it all sweet for bedroom one what's labeled bedroom one, which I would call apartment A, bedroom four. So yes, it can be. There are two doors and the way to make it not, not accessible is to lock one of those doors. All right, okay. Thank you, Mr. Langsdale. Um, we've ta you've talked about this as uh, apartment A and apartment B. And apartment A is the first floor plus this bedroom and bathroom and stairway on the second floor. What we, ha which causes problems in terms of uh, uh, egress, as we've already talked about. What is the, what is your thinking in having this bedroom be part of apartment A? Well, apartment A is a much more attractive apartment than apartment B. Uh, if you were able to get into it, you would see that it has a certain um, historic charm to it and so on. And, and um, the shared staircase, I understand the concerns that are brought up about the shared staircase, but I hadn't really seen that as a concern uh, before. And um, the person who is in apartment A, bedroom four, now labeled bedroom one, would go down that front staircase to join up with the rest of the people in apartment A. Similarly, 
the two bedrooms on the third floor would have to go down one staircase to join up with the people in the back bedrooms now labeled, um, uh, yes, that now labeled, they'd have to go down that staircase that you see, that, that's the third floor you're seeing, to get down to their friends on in apartment, um, on floor two of apartment B. I hadn't thought about any regulations that might um, transpire about common use of one staircase. Does a staircase need to be entirely devoted to one apartment or another? And if so, that would change things um, and is in that list of things to be, to be clarified. You know, um, I, if I can, I, I think that we raised some serious questions about this application. And I think this has been helpful for us to have this discussion and identification of issues that I think you and your representatives, my feeling is you and your representatives need to talk to building inspection services and uh, clear up a lot of things, many of which we've discussed. I'd also wanna give the opportunity before we, and I think for that reason, it may make sense for you to um, hold off on this um, for the time being until those, so those questions can be asked. But I also wanna give the opportunity for any public comment from neighbors and abutters, if they have other things that they would identify that we need to, need to view uh, and need to review with the, with the town. So it, I think we've identified a lot of questions. After, yeah. the, after the comments from the neighbors, may I ask the questions that have arisen? Yeah, in fact, that's one of the th reasons we ask for um, comments from the public is that to give you an opportunity to respond. So and if there are- we ask more questions of you after they have commented. You can, you can I don't know if we can answer them, but you can, you can, you can ask. Okay. Um, so I don't know if there are people from the public who wish to comment. And what I'd like to do is, is open up public comment right now. So if you do, if anyone from the public has comments, you'll have to press the button to raise your hand. Or if you're calling in, which I don't know if anyone is, you would press star nine. No one's calling in. So you would just have to raise your button for raising your hand. I'm not seeing any right now. I don't see anybody. Okay, and if somebody does later on, we'll, we'll bring them in. But, okay, Ms. Crosby, you have some questions? Yes, my first question is, I don't know your local COVID reg regulations. When would, do you have any expectation of when your COVID regulations would allow you to get inside the building? Uh, well, um, I, I can speak to that. Um, we don't actually have an official uh, uh, local uh, policy on ZBA members um, doing site visits inside houses. Um, I, I'm just been sort of uh, offering, suggesting that applicants provide photos of, in lieu of going inside just as a preventative measure. Um, you know, it, someone from inspection services uh, can certainly do a site visit and I could accompany them. And, uh, you know, if ZBA members do feel comfortable, they can certainly attend or maybe just one ZBA member. Um, so it, it's not, it's not an official policy. Okay, so um, then my next question is that, uh, as I indicated, I don't know when I'm gonna get, be able to get to Amherst. And um, I like to be law-abiding. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sorry that I had inadvertently broken the law and didn't know I was breaking it until I was uh, informed by Jackie Zuzko. So um, I have apartment A is not rented out. It is just an empty apartment. I didn't think it was good for the neighborhood or my house to have nobody in the in the building. Um, and I was very grateful that Kevin did all the hard work to get four young ladies into apartment B. That's great. Am I breaking the law if I just have apartment A, B? I'm not, I'm not physically there, but I don't see how I can physically get there. You know, I, I, you're asking, 
I don't know how you can, maybe Mr. Wasevix can answer that question, but I don't know how you can be uh, an owner occupant if you're not there. And that's what you're asking. You're asking us to make this a non-owner occupant building. So I, I mean, Mr. Wasevich, can you, can you answer that? So at this point, there should be a unit available to the owner to move, to, to go anytime or whenever that may be in order to comply with the current requirement. So I don't think there's any way to not have that space or have that space occupied by somebody other than the owner. That, that's not exactly what I'm asking. It is available to me. It's sitting right there. Should yep. I feel brave enough to get on an airplane or if I could figure out how to get to drive across the country. Yep. So, but you know, if, if, I, if it were when I was an owner occupier, I would go away on vacation. I wasn't there 24 seven. I would be gone sometimes. So I would like to consider that I'm an owner occupier who's in absentia. It's not rented out to anybody now that I know what the regulations are. But from your point of view, am I breaking the law by having my legal address be someplace else? You know, I, 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 I'm not sure that this is the forum to answer that question. I mean, what you really want to know is can you legally rent out that space and i think you just got an answer to that no that, uh, and, pardon no, me, that but, is not what i'm asking no, going back to what she's saying so if your address is california you are breaking the law or at least what zoning is requiring for that house yeah. you need to be having that your primary residence primary well. all right that's good to know because i want to be able to vote and i need to do the paperwork thank you you answered that very clearly um mr wasavage then my last question is, um, uh, and I guess Mr. Wasavich would be the one who would also um, answer this one. So um, if the house goes up for sale as an owner occupied house or as a single family dwelling, and I would be very open with, it's now not on the market, but if it were, and I'd be very open with the potential buyers is there any problem with me selling this house at this moment? You would have two choices. It has to be either as an owner occupied duplex or it can revert to a single family, but then you'd have to, depending on what the zoning is at the time, whether or not you'd have to go back to the zoning board to bring it back to its original two family or if it would have to re or remain a single family. That I can't answer. So if I, if I would like to err on the side of caution, and if it were to be put on the market for sale, I would list it as owner-occupied duplex, and I would explain that that means that, the, that there must be the owner living in one of the units. Would that be correct? That is correct. Okay, thanks. All right. I think... I sense a, a consensus among our members that this is not quite ready for prime time yet and for a vote. And I think the, I would suggest that you consider withdrawing without prejudice this application. Work with the building inspection department. You can reapply um, at a later date once you have worked out some of these questions and inspection services has looked at it and can also answer some of the questions. You can get your representative to talk to the town about it. I know it's difficult when you're in California, but you need to have somebody who can answer the questions for us when we have them um, at the next meeting. So I would suggest that the best course of action, and you can do what you wish, but I don't, I don't sense there's votes for this tonight, <laughs> that you um, withdraw without prejudice this application. Uh, Maureen. Another option, if if you'll indulge me, is that you could continue this to uh, maybe November or something that you think is reasonable uh, to give Ms. Crosby enough time to communicate with inspection services to deal with whatever matters uh, need to be dealt with. And so let's just pretend it's uh, continuing to November 15th. Um, and for some reason, if Ms. Crosby hasn't dealt with it, you could then continue it again, or maybe at that time she could withdraw without prejudice. Um, 
just so it gets continued um, and uh, so uh, 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 legal ad and the abutters um, and fees don't have to um, come into play again. Yeah, but, the, but okay, I, that's a possibility, I, yes. How considerate that is. I think that's a very considerate, um, uh, uh, customer-friendly um, amendation, Maureen. I think that uh, in my interest of clarity and uh, just getting my affairs in order, I think I probably would be better served by withdrawing without prejudice and that um, I should try to see if I can uh, change my legal address to Massachusetts so that I am complying with the law. I'm such a law-abiding freak. Uh, okay, so are you making the, are you requesting to withdraw this without um, prejudice? Is that uh, what you say, or are you? I, 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 dependent on what Mr. Maxfield is going to say, I think that's what I'll do, but well, I see that I, I'll decide, but hold on a second, right? I'll recognize Mr. Maxfield if we're going to do that, but I just want to make sure that, so I understand what, so I understand what you said, Mr. Maxfield. So uh, I guess my, my question here first is for uh, Mr. Waskevitz. Um, so is Ms. Crosby currently in violation of the law uh, by not being, by not having that as her, her current address? That seems to be the case. I don't know when she might have changed residence or if she, when all of this transpired, it, but yes, as of today, by not having her address there, she is not, it's not owner occupied. Um, then I guess my follow up question here is, uh, you know, this being brought to our attention in, in, in good faith by Ms. Crosby to be in compliance with the law, do we have any recourse to give any sort of leeway that while she's getting this, this organized that we can do we have any authority that we, we can somehow how waive that or say that she's in absentia where she doesn't have to file needless paperwork just to comply with this law if we can somehow say well this is pending for however amount of time we could say she's considered resident there in absentia something like that so she doesn't have to change her legal address to somewhere one she's not living two i do, don't think she's intending to live uh, is there anything we can do for that? Because I, 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 I think I, there I, is. Okay. So the way the house is set up, it's really a single family. So as long as it is continued to be a single family, in other words, you're not renting out more than the, the four bedrooms or, or to four unrelated people for the entire house, it'll be a single family. It's not going to lose its status unless the single family continues for over two years. So if within the next three months, whatever it's gonna take, this gets straightened out, it's still a duplex. Let's just say they're not renting that other unit right now. Um, the only trouble is, is, well, I'm, I'm think, trying to think this out. So she she can own the house, she could be renting it, but she could be renting as a single family. So I'm not seeing a problem there right now. Uh, so, but, I, she, but she she can't rent out the unrented out units right now. The apartment one she could correct. not rent out. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, I guess I am going to again one more time advocate that you consider continuing this, Faye, and the board. Um, just um, so you could have an opportunity to have a meeting with the building commissioner to uh, fully understand. Um, what type of work and perhaps the, I mean, the building commissioners uh, won't be able to give you cost estimates, but give you sort of a, a ballpark idea of how much, uh, how much work would need to be done to bring that your house up to code. If you do want to make that a two family home for the future. Um, and if, and then to, to continue with this public hearing as, with this application. Um, and so then you would avoid uh, resubmitting um, a new application. Just so I just want you to be fully aware of the, your the, options. 
of all the options. Um, may I get clarity again? I know we're being recorded. So may I get clarity to understand exactly if, um, if I have understood correctly and written down correctly. If I were to um, withdraw without prejudice my application, and if I were to keep apartment A empty, or allow the people from apartment B to wander down into apartment A and turn on the faucets and flush the toilets for me occasionally, and then have it as a single family uh, unit, as long as I did not do that for more than two years, I could revert to owner-occupied status uh, when the lease ends here, I could move out myself and I could rent to some new set of renters. Have I understood all of that correctly or is there some detail that I got wrong? As far as I understand, that would be an option. I wouldn't recommend holding it out for one year and 11 months um, before you make a decision. This is really a short-term solution to help you out if you want to look at it that way. Um, that being said, so. I, I would recommend that um, you get a letter from the building commissioner. Yeah, I, and again, I, I would, with that, I, I think I would, Maureen has a good idea. Let's, suspect, let's I'll continue this until a date that gives you the ability to go in. The only thing I don't like about that I'm concerned about is that we, there's no, is, would there be a, a subsequent abutters notice, Maureen? If this, I, I could, um, you know, add I think a, we should do uh, that. Not at a necessity, but at a, um, yeah. a courtesy. I courtesy. could, uh, I could uh, send another notice to the abutters that reside 300 feet to this property of whenever the public hearing date is in advance of the next public hearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then right. just say if we schedule, we'll schedule the next meeting now. So, you know, um, right. let's just end the meeting is October 19th between now and October 19th. If next week you're like, you know what, forget it. You could, you could then send us an email saying, you know what, I'm just going to withdraw and then you wouldn't need to come to the meeting but, or you'll come to the meeting, <laughs> but. So, so, it, did, so I understand, did, did I understand I, you to say, Maureen, that I could um, say that I'd like it to be continued, but next week I could say, you know, I thought about it and what I'd really like to do is withdraw without prejudice, but how then does the zoning board vote on that? If I'd like to, how, how does that happen of the vote? If I'd like to. You can have a representative at the meeting it can be done by email as well. Yep, we can get it done. But there could be an email vote. Uh, no, no, but, the, oh, sorry, sorry, Steve. You could you could request it through email, and we could take up the the, the matter before us. Yeah, and how um, this has been such an evolving so, and organic process that I'm wondering if I were to say I would like to withdraw without prejudice, and you might say no, 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 she can't do that. We want to decide it now. And then I'd be sort of in a well, difficult spot. You know, Ms. Crosby, I don't think that's going to happen. We're trying to help you out. And we, if we deny the, your, with, uh, your request to withdraw, we prejudice your ability to come back for two years. We're not going to do that. So I think you have two choices. I would, I would encourage you to um, not withdraw at this moment. It gives you the opportunity to go in with the, the building department and uh, work with them. As long as we send an abutters notice out, I think we have we uh, maintained our responsibility for the neighbors if there's another hearing on this. And if you decide you want to withdraw, you can still have that option open. So I think that's the best, I think that's the best for you. I know you, if you wish to withdraw, you can make that request of us now, but we can move to, to uh, continue this to a later date um, and I'm, that's my inclination, and I'd like to do that. And, if, and unless you're insistent on withdrawing it, I'm going to move that we continue this to a date certain. We pick a date in, in um, sometime in, no, I would say, in, in uh, it's going to take you a while to do this, especially long distance. I would say we pick a date, uh, Maureen, in late October um, or early November. Sure. Um... 
I would say since our October, it's Perfect. wild that we're talking about October. Uh, yeah. our October is kind of full at the Jam. moment. Yeah, so I would say the next available meeting would be November 12th. Okay. Which, uh, sure. One moment, when is Veterans Day? Um, nope, normally the 11th. One second. Uh, let me look at my calendar. Uh, holidays. September, October is the 11th. Oh, okay, but we, okay, so the 12th does work. Okay. okay. So I move that we continue this public hearing on ZBA uh, FY 2020-42 until November, what's the date, Maureen, 11th? Oh, November 12th? November 12th. If you're agreeable to that, uh, Faye, it's really up to you, obviously. You I think I need more clarity about what would be expected of me between now and November 12th. <clears throat> well, you need to you need to be able to go into the building department and ask and get some of these questions answered, you can, or to to talk with them, or to have your representative do that. And if you come along November 12th, if you want to, if you haven't been able to do that, and you want to withdraw, you can do that. If you want to, if if you have it figured out in terms of what it's going to cost you to bring it up to code to make it a duplex you do that but it seems to me that i can't answer all your questions but you it, tonight we're not ready to we're not prepared to approve this you can either withdraw it and start all over again or you can continue it much and, and i think i would encourage you to to, con to continue it try to do your work over the next two months and if it's not if you haven't got it completed you can ask for it to be continued again um, should I uh, decide that I would like to sell the property to an interested party? Would does does my decision right now have any implication for that? Or another way of saying that is, if a party is interested in buying the house, what could they do to make sure that they comply with Amherst regulations? Again, my gratitude you know, to you all. You know, for I keeping Amherst special. I agree with that. I, those are all reasonable questions, but I think at this point, uh, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know that that is really our job to help you with that. I think you should talk to talk to Ms. Zugsko. She's a, she's very she's a well-known realtor in the area. You said that you used her. You can talk to the, the town um, departments and ask them about it as well. And you can ask your representative, Mr. Cook, to work on this as well. But I don't want to be in the position of, of giving you legal advice as to what it's what's gonna happen. I think we should really move on with this, this subject tonight, okay? Thank you. So you're allowing me to keep my options open. I right. have the options open by a continuance and I am very appreciative of that and I would like to request that. And then later, should I decide that I would uh, like to withdraw without prejudice, I will communicate that to Maureen Pollock. That's correct, that's correct. Thank you. All, all right. So you've heard the motion, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to continue this public hearing till November 12th. At 6.30. That's at 6, you're so good about that, Maureen. Maureen, I, I, I love it. At 6.30, um, I, Chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. The vote is unanimous. The motion, the motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. All Good luck to you, Mrs. Crosby. Your... Thank you. You bet. Um, the next order of business, there's no other applications before the board. The next order of business is public comment on any matter which is not before us today. Um, is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak? Uh, yes, Hilda. Yes, uh, Ms. Greenbaum. This was on the agenda and I wanna tell you that coming after some very bad decisions made by the council and other boards in the last few days, your decision to decide that art doesn't need to be looked at by members of the neighborhood, I think was a big mistake. I looked at some of the 
things that they plan to put there and it looked like a railroad yard in Harlem. I don't want to look at that when I drive by. And there should at least, if you decided it was, I don't believe it was a non, you know, a de minimis change. I think putting some of that okay. bright stuff there should have at least, if you don't want neighbors to talk now, then maybe neighbors should be on the board that judges what kind of art is going to go there. But to not allow the public to have anything to say and have to drive by those billboards that they were showing as examples, I think is horrendous. All right. And, and I think when you have public meetings, they should be open to public comment because nobody in North okay. Amherst knew that was coming. And I only knew because I asked for the packet. And I think other people would be equally right. furious. Well, but well, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it now. You can't maybe no, say that some North Amherst people should be on the board to judge before something like that goes up on a wall. Well, there will, we're not going to discuss the what was already on the agenda for the night. This time, I, I, we appreciate your comments. Um, can you do something to but, fix it? But, but we're not going to discuss a matter that's, that was on, um, an item on the agenda of the meeting. This is for non-item, non-agenda items. Well, all right, so what are you going to do in the future when something like that comes up that affects a huge neighborhood up here, which has I, been, looks pretty bad, and we thought maybe it got cleaned up a little bit when you, when the auction house got, got landscaped and looked nice, and now you're going to put this horrible art all well, over it. We, Somebody may think I, it's I, art, other people don't. And that's Ms. why Ms. you Greenbaum, need to have a Ms. way Greenbaum, to get public input. I, I know I know you feel strongly about this. This is not the topic. I'm not the only I'm, one. People are I, up in arms okay, in this Okay, thank town. you, Ms. Gilda. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there any other comments on matters not before the board tonight? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Um, any any discussion of the motion to adjourn? All right. It's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Motion carries unanimous. We are adjourned. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.